Hey, it's a real privilege for me to be here. Um, it's been a really pretty, kind of a cool couple of weeks since I was asked to come up here and speak. Again, as you know, my, my parents were Larry and Nellie Ballard. My grandparents, and I don't know other than other Ballards that are here, <laughs> probably don't know my grandparents, but Afton and Annie uh, lived in Rockville. My, my maternal grandparents lived up here in Springfield, Alton and, and Della Hardy. And, uh, the little store where the, where I think it's still a Birkenstock store, is that what it is? My grandfather owned that. It was Hardy's Market. It was, you know, it's, I, in a way it was great. So uh, that's, that's kind of my, my ancestry that some of you might remember. Uh, so I'm probably the only person on earth that doesn't like put talks and stuff on their phone. And not only that, I, I can't even talk. So I have to handwrite it. I don't even put it. I don't even use a computer to do it that way. So I'm going to read a few things here. <clears throat> you know, I was, I was doing a little bit of study, and, and uh, Brigham Young called Rockville the finest location for a town on the Rio Virgin. I don't know. As I studied that Brigham Young came a time or two. He actually came to Rockville. Uh, Rockville, believe it or not, was actually the county seat of Kane County for a while. And so, you know, I was... I was born in Salt Lake City, and I, I've lived in Hurricane probably 42 years, something like that. Uh, but Rockville, and people ask me my hometown, Rockville is my hometown. That's still my hometown. That's uh, uh, where I, I learned most about, a lot about life and stuff. I'm going to do a little history here. I don't know if other folks are going to talk about the, the ancient history. I'm going to talk about it for just a moment or two. So... <clears throat> There were eight communities in this upper uh, Virgin River area. Virgin, the town of Virgin, is kind of the mother town of, maybe you all know that, but it's kind of the mother town of this area. It was 1857 that Virgin was settled. And so you have Duncan's Retreat, Adventure, which is what the predecessor of Rockville, uh, in 1861, Northrop, Shinsburg, Rockville, Springdale, and Grafton. And you can't really talk too much about Rockville without talking about Grafton, and I will do that a little bit. Uh, uh, so the first hundred years of, of all of these towns, and you can take uh, any town almost that, that Brigham Young sent people out to, to colonize, and it's about the same. It was, it was hard work. It was usually uh, in a dry, dusty place. and. Most of the time, there were Indian problems, and uh, but, and there were just really noble people that did those things. One of the things is, as, as if you read any of the histories, if, if you have ancestors that were in these old, and it could be anywhere, it could be Central Utah, it could be Idaho, it could be anywhere. The hunt, the first hundred years was almost the same. It was just almost the same stuff that went on, just in different places, and sometimes they maybe raised different things and all that kind of stuff. But, but that was, uh, uh, but you know what? They were really happy people. As you, as you read family histories and things such as that, those, those folks were, were pretty happy folks. And You know, I, I, I get thinking about, uh, you know, Rockville kind of had a personality to me. I, I, I was right, I spent, uh, my childhood there, and Rockville had this personality. It was a, uh, and Springdale did too. When I was, it was I was in the '60s, mainly '60s and '70s. And Springdale was to me was this town of merchants. You know, people had stores, and they they were the gateway to Zion National Park. And they a lot of I'm sure there were people that had you know cows and stuff like that. But Rockville was a ranching town to me. But maybe it's because. We were in that business. My my family, I say my family, and uh, the Ballard family, and the Hershey's and others. That's what they did for a living. Most of those folks. And so Rockville, to me, uh, was a was kind of a ranching town. Springdale was this town of merchants and things such as that. I'm sure everybody had a cow and all that kind of stuff. But but the livelihood for for a lot of folks in Rockville and Grafton. Uh, Grafton was a ghost town by the time I came along, but was in the ranching business and such. So. <clears throat> I'm going to talk just for a little bit about some of the structures in town. Maybe you guys are going to do that. Uh, but you know, there's there's the, the bridge that crosses the river, and they just spent a whole lot of money re, uh, re, revamping that and all that thing. 
And I don't know why, but when I was growing up, we called it the Green Bridge. And I don't, was it green at one time? I don't remember it being green. It was rusty when I came along, but they called it the Green Bridge. And it was built in 1925. And for those of you that may be familiar with how the government works, uh, Zion, the, the, the National Park Service actually paid for that bridge. They don't do that anymore if it's not in the park. Uh, but they did then because it cut about 40 miles off of the, the, the route into Zion National Park from the Grand Canyon. So, so the National Park Service, in fact, the director of the Park Service gave them 5,000 bucks to, to go towards that bridge. I, think, I can't remember what it cost. But, I think 100000 or something like that. But, uh, so the school that's in town, and I, it was always, when I was growing up, again, it was called the Relief Society Building because I think the sisters went over there from time to time. But that school was built in 1934, and the last student went through there in, in 1955. And so after that, they, they bust everybody up here. Uh, the church there, that little white chapel, I remember going there the entire time, and, and it had... It didn't even have restrooms in it when I was when I was going there, and, and it had one air conditioner in the window, one of those little window air conditioners, and you'd be there. That was when you went to three meetings a day, and and sacrament meetings started at two o'clock, even in August. And I'm telling you what, it was damn hot in there. So uh, <clears throat> I want to spend the rest of my time there. Like I said, I want to talk about some of the people that I knew, and but a town is the people there, and Rockville had just a lot of characters, and I mean that in a very complimentary way. Uh, there, there were people there that, that were just, everybody in that town, and, and I, I was looking as I drove up this evening, and I was looking at every house, and, and to this day, and I'm an old guy now, and, and I can still tell you who lived in every one of those houses, and, and I could tell you quite a bit about them probably, and I know Jeff could, and I know Gay could, and, 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 and Bernie and all the others that were there. Uh, uh, I'm just going to say a couple of, couple of names that come to mind. Marvin Terry, I remember Marvin Terry. Uh, back in those days, there was, there was a paper, it's called the Washington County News. And I know up here in Springdale, it was Sylvia Gifford that walked the streets and asked if there was anything to put in the Washington County News. In Rockville, it was Marvin Terry. And Marvin was... He, he was a he was a really a good funny guy and he would write things about Rockville I, I think it was a weekly paper or a month I can't remember but Mark he was a, he was Mark Twain you know he could write this really funny stuff and and he was this just they, they had the only public building in Rockville they had that store there and one of the great days of my life is that little it's that, that building right next to the to the church, the old church. I guess it's the town hall now. One of the greatest days of my life when I was growing up was the day that uh, you would go in that store and they had this those old freezers that had all the ice cream in it, and uh, that freezer went out and they had to give away all the ice cream before it melted. I don't know, Jeff, did you get some of that? I, would, I, I, I just remember what it, I still remember that day. I remember them just handing out all these ice creams to all the little kids in town. It was, it was a wonderful day. Uh, uh, most of you might not remember Virgil Millet. He lived right next door to Jeff and Gay, and, and uh, <coughs> Virgil was a miner, and he, he's, I, he's, I don't know where he ever got any money because he was all his goal in life was to find Montezuma's treasure, and he had a he had a mine out on the South Mountain out there. I suspect it's still there. Uh, I haven't been there for a long time, but it's probably there. And I can tell you, Virgil. I probably can't tell you in the, in this chapel area stories about Virgil, but but he was he was an interesting cat. I'll tell you that he was. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm thinking about Glenn Speed, and that's Bernie's grandfather, and Bernie may have some things to say about his grandfather. I remember Glenn Speed could take up most of sacrament meeting offering the opening prayer. Do you remember that? <laughs> and I didn't think about that too much. All I remember but it, it was this guy that would talk, that would pray a long time. But as I got older and I got and I got smarter and I got wiser, <clears throat> I got thinking that it was <clears throat> It's kind of hard for me to say a little bit. This was a man that was talking to his heavenly father. 
And, and I realized that after, after it was maybe too late to appreciate what he was saying. I just remember, I, I, never, he, I never heard him give a short prayer, but, but he was talking to God like I'm talking to you. And, and you know, it touches my heart to think about it. I, you know, I, I think about my grandparents uh, <clears throat> after the day. My grandfather, I, I was talking with a couple of them, brethren here about the, the Virgin River War. I think that's Virgin River War. Is that what this is now? <clears throat> so my grandfather was one of the most pious men I will ever meet. Because he got <clears throat> I heard my grandfather swear one time in his entire, and I was with him a lot. Uh, I was with him every single day, almost, and, and I heard him swear one time, and that was that was at a cow, and I don't think that is actually swearing. <laughs> but <clears throat> I think I was about nine years old, and it was, it was one of the most tra traumatizing things of my life to hear my grandfather say, you damn cow. And that was it. He didn't raise his voice. He just couldn't get this cow into his into the loading chute to to load him, to load her because she her it was one of his favorite cows. She she was one of the few cows that had a name. Her name was Old Cherry, and she would not get in there. My grandfather swore this one time, and uh, <clears throat> but I spent a lot of time. Uh, anyway, going back to the my grandfather had a really difficult time. I think it was maybe nineteen. 76. Things in Rockville changed really dramatically on May 30th, 1975. That was the day that I moved away <laughs> and never to return other than to visit. And I think maybe the next year, I can't remember you guys have lived here, <clears throat> that was the year that they, that, that they, they shut down, they, they closed the Rockville ward and everybody came to Springdale. Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> That was the hardest thing for my grandfather ever to do. Is to, not that he didn't like all these folks up here in Springdale, <clears throat> but they had to really talk to my grandfather to get him to come to church up here because that Rock, you know, he was a the bishop of Rockville and, and all that stuff, and it was one of the most difficult things for him to do. And so I can imagine uh, kind of the same thing, and <clears throat> it worked out. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. I don't think. I think he thought that the state presidency at the time were personally responsible for that, and, and uh, but <clears throat> anyway, it's a difficult thing for him to do. And, and uh, I wanted to. Uh, and then, and I'm gonna, I got this. Thing, I, I found this. And I'm going to read this. This is a, this is about characters, I guess. And if there's going to be four or five of you that probably know this, I'm going to read this. This is from the Associated Press in 1940. <clears throat> And those of you in Springdale and Rockville Falls, those, those ditches that go down the towns are a work of art. Those are, those are, uh, they're, they're a work of art. So uh, this is when they were putting the ditches in. Rockville voted almost unanimously for a beautification project, which included winding the street on which Mrs. Warren Hershey's luxurious mulberry trees grow. The state highway department undertook the work but reckoned without Mrs. Hershey. She climbed into the tree. The workmen withdrew. Later they returned to the mulberries. Mrs. Hershey appeared too, rifled in hand. <laughs> anyway, it talks about going further on. At the end of the day, the tree still stood. Well, I knew Mrs. Warren Hershey. She lived next door to Jeff and Kay. And, and, uh, but those, those were just kind of the characters, I guess. <clears throat> I'm running out of time, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you a couple of other, some of the things that, that I did that you couldn't probably do today, you know, or you wouldn't let your kids do. I used to hitchhike, and we all did. Uh, I started hitchhiking when I was 12 years old, because you could in those days, and uh, it wasn't unheard of to do. Uh, I had a couple other things, but I'm just going to talk about one, and, and I think anybody that speaks here tonight uh, it would walk in the shadow of this man. Who isn't here? He's one of the greatest storyteller and historian, and that's that's Leon Lewis. And uh, and <clears throat> we would we we walk in his shadow as we're here this evening. And, and I wanted to just tell a little bit about Leon and just one little story. And and I pray to God every night to forgive me for what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't have any babies born in Rockville, but when they but I remember when Vanita. Vanita Lewis was born. 
uh, and she was a beautiful little baby and all that kind of stuff. But I remember going over there and Lorna would say, she said, you know, I, she, we lived right next door. They were our next door neighbor. And, and she said to my mom and dad, we just can't get the needed to go to sleep. She is, she is, she, she's a terrible little baby for that. I think she had a colic or something and she had a really hard time getting the needed to go to sleep. And so, <clears throat> And again, I'm begging God's forgiveness for this. And so, <laughs> so in the wintertime, you know, it got dark at what, noon or something like that. So, <laughs> so we would play basketball after MIA on Tuesday nights. And, and we would come home maybe about 8 o'clock, and it's dark by then. And, and <clears throat> Tracy Cox, who's a good friend of mine, he lived on the other side of Leon, and I lived here. And I think he just, you know, he was our bishop at the time, and I think in those days he kind of, you know, he kind of did stuff, he kind of picked on the bishop a little bit. I remember when I had the opportunity to serve as bishop, and all the kids, I had more toilet paper in my trees than Mr. Whipple, you know, <laughs> the Charlemagne guy. And so, and so, we decided one night, we knew where Benita's room was, and so we came down there, and it's like 8, 8 or 8.30, and we would get these little stones, and we'd throw them up on his roof until Benita would wake up. <laughs> it was a terrible thing to do, but at the time, we thought, well, you had to find your own fun in those days. <laughs> it was a terrible thing to do, and and we didn't do it every week, but we did it a lot. <laughs> and, and Leon never said he. Once in a while, he would say, "You know, I had some varmints out in my yard last night," but he, he never got mad. And so the last time that we did it, we threw these little rocks. We could hear Benita crying, and you know, it was. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we could see this this form, and it was Leon. And uh, and Leon, I don't know how old he, I don't know how old I was, and, and he could outrun anybody until he was probably sixty years of age. You know? Well, he outran me, and, and he had he had a dozen eggs in his hand. And he, anyway, and he was laughing, and, and, and that's all he ever said. That's, that's the only thing he ever said. Was, actually, he didn't say that. He was just laughing all the time. <laughs> putting all these eggs in, in, in my hair. And so. so that was the last time I did that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to close with one last thing. And this, was, this was the thing about kind of when I was growing up. And it was something that I thought about quite a bit. When I was growing up <clears throat> in Rockville and Springdale and probably Burton and all these places, in your backyard, that was the place where you put your garden, and that's where your wood pile went, and all those other things and all that. Uh, you took your, your front yard, that's where your, where your lawn was, and that's where you put your lawn chairs, and that's where you sat. Uh, today, we sit in the backyard. We, we, we fix up our backyard and all that. We put our lawn chairs and all of that stuff in the backyard. Uh, but in those days, and I remember walking up and down the street, and every one of you, uh, everybody that's lived in these little towns, everybody put their chairs in the front yard. So, and then every night, and especially in the summertime, you would meet all of these people. Every night. And that's what they did. Uh, and that's it. And I guess that's one of the things we, you know, we've gained a lot of things in, in these days, but we've lost some things too. And I think maybe that's one of those things that uh, I remember was that was, was chairs in the front yard. Uh, anyway, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, it's been wonderful to think about all of these things. Thank you. Thank you. This tells you how short I am. Thanks, Bruce. I really hope that camera's working, Bernie. I don't know much about it, but it's on. We're going to have Shirley Ballard go next. And if you guys don't know who Shirley's parents are, and I never know how to say their maiden name. Excel. Excel. I have said it wrong my entire life. Austin and Helen Excel. She said she knew I said it wrong my whole life. Yeah. Well, I was about 19 or 20. But here you go. Does it tip down any? No. But this goes down, you ready? Slide it down. Okay. I'm 
like Bruce, I talk pretty loud anyway, so. <coughs> Bruce told a lot of things I was going to say, so I'll kind of try to skip them here. I wrote down a few details. Rockville was settled in 1862, Grafton in 1951, Adventure in 18, I'm not 19, 18, um, and Adventure in 1860, and Rockville was briefly, but only two years, the county seat of uh, King County, and then uh, Grafton was for a short time. Um, Zamira Draper was appointed presiding elder of Rockville in 1864 and served in the bishop, bishopric for the rest of his life. So, you bishops here, don't complain. <laughs> he was 64 when he died, uh, and he had been in the bishopric the entire time. In 1864, there were 18 families that lived in Grafton, and that added up to 95 people. The report I actually <laughs> took this from, it said 95 souls. <laughs> so there were 95 souls in Rockville. It was sometimes before a store was set up, so it was necessary to save everything they had. Soap was hard to come by, so they made their own, own from ashes of the cottonwood. There was no lye to be had, so they, um, they mixed the ashes and the fat from beef and pork to make their soap. All worn out clothes were saved and they were made into rugs and whatever else they could reuse them for. When fruit was grown, it was dried for winter storage. And it was a community affair with everyone picking, pitching in to help. They helped pick it, peel it, put it out on scaffoldings to dry. There were no bottles to bottle fruit then, like we have now, or cans, like we used to do in the cannery. During 1866 and 1868, where they, they had Indian troubles, which was called the, um, the Black Hawk War, all Springdale and Schoonsburg were to move into Rockville in order for them to be grouped together so they could protect themselves from the Indians if there were problems. Soon after that, they returned home after 1868, back to their given communities. The telegraph office opened in Rockville in 1871, and it served an important link to connect the Mormon settlements in Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. The telegraph was disconnected in 1903. Um, industries were brief, brief in Rockville. Silk was produced for a very short time after the mulberry trees were planted and grown, and the silkworms were brought in from, get this, China. <laughs> we haven't learned much. <laughs> there was much of a, there was much of a, well, there wasn't much of a market for the silk because the po pioneers all preferred cotton, that they had been growing their cotton and and making their cloth. Silk just didn't make it. Um, molasses was produced to trade for wheat. 500 gallons could be made from an acre of land. It was a, it was a hot commodity then and could be grown with less manpower than, it, than the wheat that they needed to build to make their bread. Thus, they made molasses and sold for the wheat they needed for the for their bread. Because of, because of irrigation, grapes, peaches, almonds, figs, and pomegranates, melons, and more were grown. Three ditches supplied water for these crops. Rockville Town Ditch, Holland, Hull Ditch, and the Grafton Ditch. There, today, there are still two of them, the Rockville Town Ditch and the, what is known now as the Holland Grafton Ditch. At that time, the Hall Ditch uh, served the south, south of the river, and the Grafton Ditch did Grafton. Now they've combined the Hall and Grafton to be the Hall and Grafton, because <laughs> it does everything on the south side of the river. 
Um, around 1863 to 1809, the building of the Hurricane Canal, and we all have heard this many stories about the Hurricane Canal, it had a big impact on the Upper Virgin River communities. Floodwaters often washed away good fertile ground, and the population was increasing to the point more far farmland was needed for grown sons of the saints to have their own farms. The census in 1990 was 194 people. In 1900, it was 214 people. In 1910, it was 189 people. And in 2020, it was 247. And that's the latest, I don't know that we, that I remember what the new census said of Rockville, but it's still right around that same stuff. Cattle and dry farming became a real economic activity in 1900. Many men had several to 100 head of cattle. In 1901, there were 20 brands registered in Rockville for cattle and four for sheep. When you think about that, that's a lot of different families and cattle and sheep operation going on. Um, in 19, between 1905 and 1906, several, several of the Rockville farmers grew wheat on the Big Plain without irrigation the first dry farm, farming that went on. Later, corn, melon, squash, and cane were raised. In 1914, an estimated 3,000 cattle were pastured on Kolob in the summer and the Big Plain in the winter. In 1924, the National Park Service built the bridge across the Virgin River in Rockville to accommodate the increased traffic from Zion to the North River Grand Canyon, as Bruce brought up. An interesting thing of that about that is in Jeff's mom's My Life Story, she writes about the celebration they did the day they dedicated that. And there was a foot race. She ran a foot race in 1924 and won a, a comb and a bracelet and a ribbon, a comb and a, a ribbon for her race across the Rockville Bridge. <laughs> so that, I think that's pretty interesting. Electricity came to Rockville in 1926, and Indian, indoor plumbing for some came in 1928. There were many who didn't have indoor plumbing for years and years after that. During World War I, many young men left to either serve in the armed forces or to work uh, in the war industry. Many had intentions to return, but few actually did. The CCC and the WPA, as Bruce mentioned, uh, came at that time, and they brought new blood to Rockville. In 1939, the WPA group built the rock line ditches along SR9 and the bleachers next to the old schoolhouse I don't know if any, uh, many of you have ever stopped and looked down into that area just before you get to the old school house when you're coming up the road on the right, but it has quite a, we always call it the amphitheater there. The, and it still stands today. It's been preserved quite a bit. Um, Rockville was incorporated on June 30th, 1987. A mayor and, town board, and a town board was appointed by the county to serve until the next elections. I was one to be appointed to the town council at that time, and I served for two more years. I served on the planning commission in Rockville for 26 years. The town is a rural, residential, and agricultural community. Since its founding by Mormon pioneers, Rockville has man maintained its integrity of its historic town plan and has been re referred to by historians as the last treasure town. We had no public building to meet in when we were incorporated in, in Rockville. So we used private homes to meet. We wrote and adopted ordinances at our dining room table and we held planning commission meetings there 
for Elaine, can you help me how many years? I don't know. But my kids, our kids still today talk about when we were holding meetings in our dining room. And mind you, our house is not big. Our dining room table was about maybe twice the size of this little table here and we all sat around it and we had to borrow chairs when we were when everybody was there and they still talk about how they had to stay in their bedrooms for hours my <laughs> mom had a meeting. <laughs> they still talk about that. Um, unlike all other municipalities, Rockville has no employees. Only two office help, the, the town clerk and the assistant clerk. All the work done in Rockville is done by the people that we call the STP group, same 10 people. <laughs> Only now it has changed to more like seven. We don't have a sanitary sexton or a maintenance chief or anyone else to do the work, but it all gets done by those of us who still love Rockville. <laughs> Where was Adventure? Wasn't Adventure just outside of Rockville, just barely? About, about three quarters of a mile west of the Okay. So three quarters of a mile west of That's what I remember, basically on television. And Shunsburg. Shunsburg is up in the back part of Trees Ranch. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Adventure is about where Alan's Crusher is now? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, what did you say? I was thinking East of So, what was the question again? What's yeah. that? They answered it. Well, maybe somebody else did. Oh, just east of, just east of Alan's. East of Alice Place. Okay, Lori? Um, does that road still go through uh, off the bridge? It went, they said it went over. Oh, yeah. The, you can go, you head over towards the uh, highway, is it 59? Is that where it picks up? So, yeah. Go over Rockville Mountain if you want to have an experience, do it in a rainstorm. <laughs> <laughs> Friday Hill, right? Yeah, Friday Hill. I'll tell you what, we had to go rescue a girl one day up there in the mud, and we lost the inside part of the fender of the truck trying to get her out. So, all right, you guys, I want to thank everybody so far, and I did not get this on recording. So, Bruce Ballard was our first speaker, and his parents were now in Larry Valley. Can you tell me the name of your grandpa from Rockville again? Afton and Annie. Afton and Annie. Okay. Um, we're going to go on to Gay Ballard, who happens to be Shirley's sister-in-law. I knew her mom, Daisy. She was a sweetheart, and I swear you look just like her. And Elwin was your father, right? And so, you know, I never got to meet him. So we're going to turn over to turn the time over to her. that's tough for me to think about how our little town has changed, but we're trying to keep it the same. And my life began in 1945 in Rockville. We had a few businesses, a, a cafe, and, a, and had a cabin, cabins and station, a service station. It was where um, Joe Hershey has his fruit stand. Jack, Jack Henderson ran it. wasn't long after he, it burned to the ground. Nobody knew why, but the Springdale Fire Chief, Dick Lawrence, came, brought his fire truck, and was able to put it out, and after the smoke had settled, all the kids was going through all the ashes, and they found brown marshmallows. <laughs> Eva Hershey ran the post office, it was a small post office. Only two people could be in the office at the same time, and that was Eva and one other person. Then she retired, and so it went to Charlie Powers, and he took over the post office. And then Alma Cox 
was the next, and now we have our nice one. <laughs> Marvin and Lamar had a grocery store. Of course, Bruce mentioned this. They had a gas pump and a phone booth. They sold a few groceries, nuts and bolts, but they mainly had a lot of good candy. <laughs> and they had uh, soda, and they had the best uh, cheese. It was in the red rind. And they had a knife that was the biggest thing I had ever seen, and it was always on the counter to, count, to cut that red rind. <coughs> we could go over there and buy a soda and a few candy, pieces of candy, for a quarter. We thought we were pretty good kids to be able to do that. And then they sold it to Mrs. Lang, and she ran it for a couple of years, and then made it into a rental, and the building is still here. Then we had a family move in with a bunch of children, and their names was Howard and Thelma Christensen. They moved in and built a rock shop, and a little later, Howard built the biggest dinosaur you ever saw. <laughs> and that was to attract the customers, and it, it worked pretty darn good. They done pretty good. But they had the coldest soda of all in Rockville. And that's where the desert thistle, thistle is now. Or, and Laura Mill, they had a fruit stand in the summer, and they and she made bread and had a few bottles of jams and jellies, and that's where Carol and Jim Harlan lived. Our school was closed when I was in the third grade, and from then on we had to go to Hurricane. And then at the fourth and fifth grade we went to Hurricane, and then in the sixth they sent us back to Springdale, which we didn't like since we've made all those friends. And on Bennett Lane, there was a few cabins there that was rented out. And then when I was about 10, we got our phones. Wow, we thought we were something else. We were like Hurricane now. And we had, we, it was party lines, and I think ours was three rings, but every time you got a call, there's always someone listening. <laughs> <laughs> then TVs came to town. And oh boy, we were all excited about that. And our father sold a couple of cows to buy a TV. And when we go to watch the TV and all the kids would come around, all we watched was snow. No <laughs> TV at all. We had a lot of floods like we do. We don't have them like we did then. And we'd all go, to go down and watch the floods. And, and then we still do that. My brother Lynn and Mike Hershey would climb the top of that bridge and dive into the, to the muddy water. And I was told, if I ever told, I would be so sorry. <laughs> Mom and Dad built a little building, which is called, is called the hot dog stand. They built that so my two brothers, my older brothers, would have something to do and not to get into trouble. But Mom always said they gave more away than they ever sold. So then my other, my other brother, him and his wife needed a place to live, and so they made that into an apartment, and they lived there until they found a bigger place. Then my other brother moved his family in there, and then the last ones was Jeff and Shirley, and now it's rented and it is still there. Jeff and I always had a fruit stand to earn a few nickels. Mom would get us started, it was up to us to pick and sell. I think we ate more cherries than we sold. <laughs> Bilo DeMille had her homemade quilts hanging out on the side, and she did pretty darn good making a little extra money. Her quilts were absolutely beautiful. And by the cemetery, there's a dance hall, and it has a stage, and there used to be live music. And that was for the folks to be able to go have a little night on the town. And we had a fellow that would take us, he'd have a bicycle, and he would pull us on our skates, and we'd go round and round that thing. Just as many times as he'd pull us, and on our sidewalks was blacktop. There wasn't cement, and you imagine no we're skating on that. Well, he'd pull us down and up the road, and everybody got to take a chance. <laughs> and we've had so many times, so many different boulders rolling off of our mountain, and the one that landed, went on SR9, ran, ran over into Dickman's, 
ranch and that was the or uh, Rockman River Ranch and the rock is still right where it landed and Jack Burns is pretty lucky to still be here because one hit his home. Eight years ago we had such a tragedy. My first cousin Maureen and Jeff they lost their life and it was such a tragedy for everyone. Every carry every town has a character like Bruce mentioned and we had Virgil Millet. He thought he could find the Montezuma treasure and he would go to that South Mountain every day and dig and dig and he kept adding rungs to his ladder. And I don't know how many rungs there is, but my dad always told him, if you work that hard as a job at a real job, you'd be able to have some money. <laughs> but he he did and finally he did get a job to work on Mesa. And it was hard work and it was hot and it was summer and he came home and was so tired and the next morning he rode with some other guys and they stopped and honked and he never did come out. And he finally laid out his head and he says, tell him I died in the night. <laughs> <laughs> Rockville has been a beautiful place to raise your family and live and especially for your golden years. <laughs> On the, rock, the black, on the red rocks above where the, probably the store was, there's a, uh, a sign or something. Do you remember what that sign is? Jack does. Oh, Salt Lake Hardware. Is oh, that what that little uh, sign is? Yeah. Looks like a Pepsi, kind yeah, of like a Pepsi. Yes. Salt Lake Hardware. And so that was part of the store. No, no, no it was oh, just a so it's not a Pepsi sign? <laughs> okay, I don't make the chip. I don't know your response is Pepsi. Um, any other questions for Dave? Okay, the next person we're going to listen to is Bernie Harris. He is a character. How everybody says there's a character in every town. Bernie was the character I knew for a while. And uh, we're going to turn the time over to him. And his mom and dad was what were. Maureen and Franklin Harris, and his dad was the smartest person I ever knew. Very much so. Thank you, Joe. We still at home. I can't stand anymore because I'm old. Not as old as Joe Normal does. <laughs> That's, that's good enough for good sport. Well, not necessarily. Okay. Hold on. When Chris asked me to tell about my life in Rockville, uh, there's a front story to that that most people don't know, and that is that I wasn't born in Rockville. Uh, I was born in the year 1944 in Salt Lake City to Frank and Maureen Harris. <clears throat> one of three, or one. One of 12 siblings, uh, there were seven sons who all became Eagle Scouts. My father's father was Franklin S. Harris Sr., president of Utah State and BYU, BYU for 25 years. On my mother's side, Len and Della Steed were sent on a mission by their son-in-law to the southern states and the year before they left, the year they did leave, I made a road trip with Vernon to Beth Dickman down Highway 89 and they wanted to find property in a small town. <coughs> they looked and looked as I forward to death. But anyway, we stopped in Rockville at the west end of town, which some will remember was a, the state had little camp areas there with a table and a trash can. So we were glad to get out right across the street, big, huge rock. I mean, a really big rock. But we went over and we noticed a faded sign that said for sale. Well, out of that, we found Arch Fowler and uh, the Dickmans bought 21 acres there. 
And if I told you the price, you'd all faint. <laughs> but uh, as my grandparents got back up in their mission, they'd been told about this place, and so granddad was always a green thumb, so they came and they ended up buying Horace DeMille's place. Am I right, Jeff? Which is where the old telegraph office is, and they built the butterfly roof that you see in Rockville, which is a very strange house. But they, my granddad found that in a better homes and garden. And that's the home that they built, and they were there until they moved to St. George in the 80s to be closer to the temple. <coughs> and the home was given to my parents. And my parents, my, group, my dad was a doctorate of physics, taught at U University of Utah for 21 years. I told my family, I said, Dad ain't gonna like that. He's gotta be around in really intelligent people. Well, it was quite, quite something that he fell in love with the place and he put on his old hat and away he'd go. But <clears throat> I came in 1957 when my grandparents were building that house. So that's the first time that I spent time in Rockville. And over a period of years, I was fortunate enough with my granddad's help to buy a home in Rockville at a probate court for $3,050. And uh, at that time, I romance in a sweetheart that I met in Las Vegas, Nevada. And she was kind enough to take the missionary lessons and let me baptize her. She's been my rock now for 58 years married and 60 years of dating. We're the parents of uh, nine children. We have uh, three of those that are uh, in this Rockville Cemetery. And I have a grandson that's married there. But Rockville to me when I was a kid, coming from a big city of Salt Lake, was idyllic. That was the funnest place in the world. Gay told you about this hamburger stand, we call it the hot dog stand. My grandparents lived in there for a short time where they were living in the house, but first time I went there, the only place to sleep was on Gay and Jeff's parents' lawn. They were very kind people, and uh, I, I still don't totally know the story behind their name of Lovey and Buckboard. And maybe Jeff will touch on that. But they were wonderful people. And all the people in Rockville when I were there were hardworking, honest people. And I learned, I learned more from those people than I did in school or anywhere else. If things needed to be done, everybody showed up. People may not know that the ditch used to go from almost the driftwood clear down to uh, Lee's gravel pit. That ditch would have to be cleaned a couple of times a year and it was all done by hand. And if you went to those, you would find 20, 25 men with a shovel, a file, and an old burlap bag glass bottle of water and they went they'd go down through that uh, unbelievable to watch but that happened for years until we finally were able to get a quote-unquote pipeline but that's that's been a headache for years now it's it's old and it's dilapidated but uh, Bruce mentions his dad granddad Afton and Annie when I was a boy Afton had a peach orchard in Grafton, and so he hired me. We went and picked uh, 50, 50 flats of peaches, and we drove out to Escalante. And uh, he knew family out there. I don't remember who it was, but they put us up. I right? slept on the lawn, but we we uh, got rid of those peach flats in in a, a day and a night. They were gone. And I think uh, in total, I think he said he made 50 or 60 bucks. And that covered his gas and a little pocket change. 
But that's the way these people were, and I, I, uh, I always had the desire to be like them, to give back as much as you can. And uh, I was fortunate enough to raise my family in Rockville. We spent uh, from 1974 until this last year when we moved to Washington City. And uh, I was a hard blow. I, I thought I'd die in that home. But now I live in Washington in a postage stamp. And uh, my wife is tickled to death. And uh, we are now the uh, proud owners of two rescue dogs that uh, they're all the delight of our lives. But uh, the town has changed over the years. And uh, to me, not changes that were the greatest. We've lost a lot of our identity. And thanks to many town councils and planning commissions, we've tried to hold its place. My concern is, is another election and that could change in a heartbeat. But hopefully it, it, it stays the same. Uh, people that made an impression on me were Afton and Annie. We, uh, Eldon and Daisy. Dee and, I can't remember Dee's wife's name. Cora. Cora, Cora Cox. Um, these were all people salt of the earth. My granddad, when he was building his house, Dee was there every day, laying, laying brick, doing the plumbing. A lot of stuff got done by just help from neighbors. And uh, my granddad always appreciated Rockville. He was born in Kaysville, and uh, they, had a, they had a small place up there in the farm, but we heard the story about uh, Abton cussing his cow. My granddad had a cow, and her name was Worry. Good milker. She'd give you a, a lot of milk. Well, one day, we were down there, and she kicked a can over. And my granddad looked at me, and I'd never seen that face. said, you get on up to the house. And as I headed up there, I could hear, crap, you damn cow. Granddad didn't like to waste anything, and he lost a whole bucket of milk, a night's milking. So Bruce talks about his dad, him being shocked. I was shocked, because I never heard anything like that out of my granddad's mouth. Once my grandfather, my folks moved there, um, I had the fortune of being able to spend a lot of quality time that I hadn't been able to have. My dad left the University of Utah on a sabbatical and went to work for Aerospace Corporation in California. So we went to California and I went to Maricosta High School. Fell out of place, but big school, great football team. And I got called into the counselor's office one day and she said, uh, the credits you have from Utah make you a sophomore here. And I said, oh no. So I went home, told mom and dad I wasn't staying at Maricosta High School. I wasn't going to start over. So I got on a bus, Greyhound bus, to Hurricane, Utah, and started school in Hurricane. And I might add, I was the first male cheerleader in the history of Hurricane High School. <laughs> now that came to be because I got there, uh, I don't remember the reason, but something in the, the handbook, I couldn't play football. So the only way I could see the game was I hooked up with the cheerleaders and I would travel with them to the games. It was quite interesting. I couldn't jump, couldn't uh, do black flips, but I could lift the girls up. Yay. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Another, another good story that, and Don may remember this, you didn't have a bus to take you home at night if you were in sports. 
you had two choices. You either hoped you could get a ride at the bottom of the hill, and if you did, you may get to good old Virgin, and I spent several nights in Wilcox's barn, and then I'd catch the bus and go back to school the next morning with straw and everything else hanging. But it was a great life. We'd get up, there was always chores. Noon, where did we go? We went to the river. The river was just a, a wonderful place. Boys, girls, and we would just have a heyday in, in the river. And that was back when there wasn't a sewer system. <laughs> and most of the uh, <laughs> sewer went into the river. And, <laughs> and you could always say, oh, look at that <laughs> but uh, so we, we, we used to do that. We used to ride horses all the time. We used to walk to Grafton more times than I could count. But we never thought to take water. Scout, yeah, be prepared, no. So we just drink water out of the irrigation ditch. Never died, I'm still here. <laughs> but uh, I, I can't, I can't put into words what growing up in Rockville meant to me and did for me as a young man and later a husband and a father raising kids. And most of our kids didn't stay in Rockville because there was no work back then. The only work really that you could get there was at the park service and a few of the stores. But, uh, so they moved on, and, and uh, some of them thought maybe they'd like to buy the house, but then they didn't know what they'd do when they got here. Uh, they talk about uh, Marvin Terry being a character. You've heard her talk of the store. Well, the thing about that store is this, it was worn out. You could see over the years it had been worn out. But Marvin loved a good water fight, and he would get his tap out by the gas pump, and we'd, we'd have at it. And he would just laugh himself to death at how much fun he was having. I don't know how Marvin was then, but he had, he had some years on him. But he loved to be a kid again. And I just got the finger, said the time's up. <laughs> Two minutes? Holy, what am I going to say now? Right. Huh. Did you want to tell them about the Fox family? Did you mention it to Oh. A family you Bruce, to Bruce mentioned Tracy Cox, and Tracy came from a family of five, three girls, two boys. Their mother was the daughter of a, my mother's very good friend. And uh, in, Salt Lake. in Salt Lake, and Angie uh, wasn't able to have children. Her parents lived there, but my mother got the idea to bring them down and introduce them to the Cox family. And in, in the length of the day, they were calling them mom and dad, and they were adopted. And. Uh, it was a wonderful thing, and, and uh, we lost Stephen several years ago to a tragic, traffic, tragic accident, and I miss him every day. But uh, they're just wonderful stories and wonderful people in Rockville that most of you haven't heard and probably won't hear other than what I've babbled on about. But I'm grateful for my friendships, I'm grateful for this opportunity to give my experiences, and I wish I had been born in Rockville, it would have made it real nice, but my mom and dad were in Salt Lake people, and dad was teaching intelligent students at the University of Utah, so <laughs> that's, that's my story, and I won't deny it. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. I'm just going to clarify something he told me. 
His mom met the Cox children in Salt Lake. Your mom was instigated, the instigator to hook her up with Angie Cox, those, that mother. With, with the family, that, that's it. And their mother was, was uh, back in the days, was uh, basically 24 7. So, how old were when they come to check me, Angie and Bob? Oh, my word. Bruce? Alma. I mean, Alma and Bob. Yeah, Alma and Angie. Boy, I'm mixing up. I, they were young. They weren't very old, but they fell right in, and Tracy and Stephen are the epitome of their dad, hard worker and uh, a giver. Sandy was just a couple of months old. Sandy? And she didn't come with them to begin with because she was too young. She, Lori. Lori? Lori. Lori. Well, Steve, and Bernie told me that Steve, that he used to babysit Steve and change his diaper, so if that's a that key for you. That was in Salt Lake, and he was months old. It was a good way to make a fun back then. <laughs> Well, I just think he probably could have went to some uh, map if he needed a whip, too. <laughs> hey, uh, we're going to turn the time back over to Jeff. And Jeff is married to Shirley, and, and uh, Gay is his sister. So, one of the nicest men I've ever met in my life. Oh, boy. <laughs> Bernie and Gaye and Grandma had a 58 Dodge. And I, well, I think Jim wondered why he had to put tires on that thing at all. Yeah, there was a reason. Anyway, another story about Marvin Carey. <clears throat> when I was a kid, the guy that owned the store, he had a tomato patch out back and uh, he had the wire cages around the tomatoes. And uh, one day a big buck came down. Uh, up in the river and got his head tangled up in these wires. Well, Marvin tried to take the wire off the buck's head and it got Marvin on the ground and he was holding it warm like this, looking up to heaven. And uh, the, the deer was just about to gore him and my uncle happened to be back there and he went over and shot the deer off Marvin. <laughs> True story. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff on Rockville, but I thought I'd talk a little bit about drafting. Uh, that's where my, the Ballard family came from. Uh, Grafton was first uh, established in 1859, and the, present, the, the first town was about a mile below the present town that's there now, and it was washed away, and so in about 1860, they moved upstream, and they, uh, the fellow that named Grafton was Charles Merriweather, excuse me, Slaughter, and he gave the name Grafton. My dad always growing up called it Wheeler, and uh, I always called it Wheeler. I didn't know what Grafton was for a long time, and but dad always called it Wheeler. Anyway, to, you have to kind of go back and figure out what brought the Saints into, uh, can you hear me okay? Sorry. Uh, in 1861, during the Civil War, was disrupted the flow of cotton. Brigham Young called hundreds of families to come south. And uh, they'd already driven or brought their hand carts and their wagons across the plains 1,500 miles and to be disrupted again and sent south. And uh, they, they uh, heeded that call and they uh, used their own resources to build the roads, clear the land, dug ditches, constructed homes, built churches and schools, fenced pastures and planted gardens. And the first uh, church in Grafton was a, uh, I believe it was a uh, 18 by 24 log building. And it was right where the, the church that's there now is. And that church was built in uh, 1880, Six and I believe dedicated in July of 88, 1888. Anyway, uh, 
Residents would meet on Sunday for worship and often during the week for other social activities. Families enjoyed singing, dancing, making candy, popping corn, swimming, horseback riding, corn and chicken rolls and melon bus. Life was precarious. Flash floods repeat, repeatedly washed out their irrigation dams, filled their ditches with silt and carried away their precious farmland. I don't know if you've ever cleaned ditch, but it's a it's a arduous job and to have this happen day in and day out as the the river flooded like it did, you know, they'd put a cedar tree dam in and and the flood would take it away and then they'd rebuild it and clean out their ditches and go on with life. It was just a fact of life. Uh, in 1865, the Southern Mission Report of Land Under Cultivation gives a combination acreage for grafting and settlements above there, including Berryville, which is Long Valley, and Canab, Shunesburg, Springdale, and Rockville. A total under cultivation was 396 acres, but there's other sources that said there was 2,000 in grafted alone in 1865, but I think they were referring to the big plains and it was all dry land. And he raised wheat and those types of things out there. Uh, Grafton was not without its tragedies. Uh, in 1863, uh, Jeremiah Draper built a uh, cotton gin in Grafton. And uh, one night, uh, he was getting ready to go home and had his lantern uh, there, and the, the wind caught the door and blew it and uh, blew some flame out of the lantern and it lit on the floor and, and started the cotton on fire that was there. He reached down to put it out with his hand, but it spread and caught himself on fire. He jumped out the window to, to get away from the flames and he survived it. And then the, the men that were working there helped put out the fire and he lost 300 pounds of cotton. But, but the story about it is they, they'd uh, never rebuilt the cotton gin, and so the, uh, the ruins were used for kids as a playground and a gymnasium. It just had a big frame with a kind of a swing on it. And so uh, uh, on Thursday, February 15, 1866, uh, just like every other evening, the kids would go out to, to go up to the old cotton gin and swing, and uh, two girls, uh, Elizabeth Woodbury and Loretta Russell, known as Letty and uh, Lizzie, uh, were both killed when this uh, <coughs> collapsed, and they were such good friends that they buried them together in a common grave in Grafton. And Letty was 14 and Lizzie was 13. I don't know if there's any of you familiar with the Berry brothers that uh, were killed by Indians. Anyway, I'll tell you the story. Uh, it was Joseph and Robert Berry and their wife, Mary Isabel Hales. And they were visiting Grafton in, in uh, April of 1866 during the Black Hawk War. And uh, they were headed back to Berryville by way of, uh, which is now you know, Colorado City, Nav Road, because the tunnel, of course, wasn't built then. And uh, the people in Grafton told them that they better not go because they'd be killed by Indians if they did. So they they needed no warning because they were in their twenties and thought they were invincible, I suppose. And uh, anyway, they got out to uh, a place called Cedar Knoll, which is just uh, a little bit south of uh, Colorado City. And there's a big dry sandy wash that you have to go down through and then come back up the other side. Well, when they got to that spot, the Indians set up on them, and uh, uh, they they estimated there was probably about 26 uh, Paiutes and Navajos. And uh, one of the arrows hit one of the mules under the collar, and it uh, caused him such great pain that he collapsed. And then the Indians set up on him and killed him. They uh, they had uh, three revolvers, a shotgun, and a rifle with them. And uh, when they the, the man that uh, came looking for him, they were supposed to be in the at a certain time. They didn't show up, so they sent out a posse to uh, try and locate him. And anyway, that's where they found him there. And they uh, two, two men from Grafton took uh, 
the back seat out of a buggy and drove out there and loaded his body and brought him back to Grafton and they had the funeral in Grafton and then buried him in the cemetery that are, that are buried there today. If you ever go down there, you can see it. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was a lot of Indians in Grafton and they were there were several of them buried there and uh, my, my dad told me that uh, the one of them was Cedar Peak and uh, Indian Wiley, and, and when they they buried him, they uh, they did a traditional uh, LBS funeral for them. But at the gravesite, they put all their their choicest blankets, guns, jewelry, and two of those Indians they dug dug a grave next to them, and they shot their horses and put them inside the grave with them and their saddle and their ropes, which is kind of an odd thing, but that's what they did. Uh, Grafton, uh, of course, is, is very picturesque and, uh, and highly visited, and uh, the movies found Grafton in 1929 with the uh, Arizona Kid, and it was the first outdoor talkie that was ever made, it was made in Grafton with uh, Warner Baxter, and then in 30, they did, they filmed the Arizona Kid, and Warner Baxter was also in it, and uh, then 47 was uh, Ramrod, and 1969, of course, everybody knows Butch Cassidy and the Sunday Kid, and uh, there's uh, one scene in there where Paul Newman's riding his bicycle down the hill, and Captain Ross is sitting in the barn, well, that's my dad's old barn, and uh, they, when, during that scene, my dad and I were down there watching it, and, because uh, they were renting my dad's property, and uh, they brought an old bull in, and uh, a cow, and they run the cow in front of that bull, and so the bull chased the cow, and it made it look like they were chasing, trying to run over uh, Paul Newman. <laughs> and another uh, thing, uh, my uh, mom and dad were down there watching him film one day and they invited him to lunch and mom got set by Paul Newman and he, she always said, boy, he's got the bluest eyes. <laughs> anyway, uh, and there were a couple other low budget films, uh, Child Bride of Short Crick and Red Fury. And uh, you know, I've got a lot of their stuff, but I know we're getting short on time, so I'll probably leave it at that. But I, I appreciate it. and. Uh, Thank you. Any questions? Time over to have her say a prayer, but I'm going to turn off the camera before that happens. <laughs> 